there are what they call options. And if you remember what an option is, an option is the right to do something in the future that we agree on it now. And most landlords, especially in the commercial world, will grant what they call renewal options to the tenant. They may sign a three-year lease and then tell the tenant, oh, <clears throat> after that lease, I'm going to give you another three-year option that you can stay if you choose. And typically those leases or those options are at the decision of the tenant as long as the tenant is in good standing with the landlord. So think about what I'm saying. If you are a landlord and you have got a subway on a five-year lease and they are in good standing, meaning they have not been problematic, they are current on their monthly rents, they are a good tenant, why would you not want them to stay another five years? The caveat in this is that word in good standing. Because if there is a three-year option and the tenant says, well, it's my decision, I'm going to opt to extend my lease, the landlord's going to go, no, you are not in good standing. You are four or five months behind on your uh, rental payments. Therefore, that option's not valid anymore. And come the end of this lease, you're out and we'll get a better tenant. So those renewal options are at the discretion of the tenant. There are things that they call um, purchase options, a purchase option, meaning, and these you do see in the residential, and you will hear it called a lease with an option. So the tenant may have the lease, it has a lease in place, and at the end of that lease, or any time during that lease, they would have the option to buy the property from the landlord. This is typically one way that in the residential world, you will see a landlord say, hey, look, I'll do a lease with an option. First 12 months, pay me lease. And then at the end of that time frame, you have the option to buy the house and stay there if you like. That would be two separate documents, by the way. One is the lease. The other is the option portion. And they could exercise the lease. And then at the time the option is required, they could go, nah, we're not going to buy. We've decided that we're going to move back to St. Louis. So we're not going to buy. Even though we were under a valid lease and we paid rent, we are not exercising the option. There is another one in here. I don't think it mentions it. Let's talk about this other one. There's another thing called the first right option. And you will see this a lot. The first right option says that the tenant has the first refusal to buy. So sometimes you hear this called the right of first refusal. The right of first refusal or a first right option. What that is saying is if the landlord says, you know, I think I'm going to sell that building. He first would have to go to the tenant because the tenant gets the first right to refuse the purchase. Or the other way of looking at it is he gets the first chance to buy it. Now this clause actually has to be in the lease for it to be valid. It's not an automatic. So the landlord would go to the tenant and say, hey, Mr. Tenant, I have decided I'm going to sell this office building. You have the first right of refusal inside of your lease. So I'm here to say, do you want to buy the building? And the tenant would say, yes, let's go through the purchase process. 
and I will buy the building from you. Or the tenant could say, no, I really don't want to own it. I'm happy just being a tenant. And the landlord says, okay, I am now going to take this property to the open market and sell it to another investor. That would be the right of first refusal. All right. It actually gives the tenant the chance for the first person to buy the property. All right. So I want to cover some types of leases. Before we begin, I want to give you the caveat that understanding one of the cool things to me in property management is actually this. Because in a purchase, while there is some negotiation and price and things like that, boop, that conveyance, the property's gone. In the leasing, it is a spectrum of what could be done. And there are a lot of things that could be done. And I really enjoy creating or having that negotiation with the tenant about what kind of lease we're going to structure. And remember, anything can be in the lease as long as it's legal and all as long as both parties agree. So you will see some things and I'll we'll point them out as we go along. So the first type of lease I want to talk about is this thing called a gross lease. Now, in a gross lease, you have the landlord. That's wrong again. You have the tenant who pays the landlord money. This is a gross lease. And the word gross means total like gross operating income. And in this situation, when the tenant pays the landlord a gross amount of money, and then the landlord goes out and pays most of the bills, like the homeowners association or the real estate taxes, things like that. So the tenant is giving the landlord a gross amount. This is very common, mostly in your residential world. When someone says, well, I'm renting a house and I pay $900 a month. That would be the gross lease. And then the landlord would go out and, like I said, maybe pays the real estate taxes, pays the homeowners association, may pay the property insurance. So that would be a gross lease. A second type of lease is where the tenant pays the landlord money, but watch this. But now the tenant goes out and pays the landlord's bills. And in essence, the tenant is paying the net money. That's why it's called a net lease because the landlord is receiving the rent after the bills are paid and he is still charging that amount. This is typically your high-end commercial properties like your publicly traded companies. Remember we talked about a sale with a leaseback? That leaseback by Home Depot or CVS or Pizza Hut or whoever it is, is going to guarantee a return to the landlord. And how do they guarantee that return? Because if any of the expenses go up, who's paying them? The tenant is paying the expenses like the real estate taxes the property insurance, and the maintenance on the building. So if any of those go up, the landlord is still receiving the same rental income. Let's flip back over here for a second. If one of these bills goes up and the tenant's still paying $900 and taxes go up, 
What happened to the landlord's net income? It goes down because he's paying more expenses. In this scenario over here, because the tenant is paying the bills, if the uh, taxes go up, the landlord is still receiving the same number, i.e. the net money, that's why it's called a net lease, that return to the landlord stays the same. And the golden goose of this is what you will hear called a triple net lease. Or I have heard it called net, net, net. Triple means three, so there's three ends there. Net, net, net. This is, and the three big nets are like I mentioned a minute ago. The real estate taxes, the insurance, and the maintenance on the building. So Home Depot would have its own maintenance man to make sure the property stays in good condition. Even though that building technically is owned by the landlord, this is the agreement that Home Depot made. In this particular example, you would get net, 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 or a triple net, and therefore this 6% would remain the same no matter what happens because the tenant's paying the inspections. And I told you that this is a spectrum because there are some companies, Dollar Tree, does what they call a double net lease or just net net. They are going to pay the taxes and they will pay the insurance. They have a belief that the property owner should maintain the building. So if you want to build a building and rent it out to a Dollar Tree, their corporate policy is we only rent net net. We only do a double net. And that's what I'm talking about that spectrum. You guys can agree on that. You can agree on a net net and Dollar Tree pay the first $5,000 of maintenance, and we pay anything over $5,000. So that's what I'm saying. The spectrum here, you can agree on this. It's not always going to be absolute that it's going to be triple net or gross. It could be something in between that you guys kind of agree on. And that's what I said. I kind of like the idea of building these and negotiating this. So that is uh, two types of leases. Actually, I pushed the wrong button. It's two types of leases. You've got the gross lease and the net lease. All right. So think about that. Generally used for those large commercial or publicly traded companies. The next example is this thing called a percentage lease. Percentage leases are used a lot in the retail or restaurant business. I've seen them in restaurant. So what happens in a percentage lease is the tenant will pay some sort of fixed amount called a base and then some amount of percentage of the sales they make. Sometimes I have heard this called a participation lease meaning that the landlord participates in the business by saying, dude, if your business makes a whole bunch of money, your rent is going to go up accordingly. And these are negotiated between the parties, exactly like I said a minute ago. I like the ability. So what this looks like is this. Is a tenant may end up paying some base rent. And we're going to make up an example here of a thousand dollars a month plus 4% of gross sales. Now you have many, many different parts here. You've got this number, that's the base, 
Then you've got the percentage. Notice this says and. So this tenant's going to pay some base plus 4% of their sales. So let's say they sold a million dollars. 4% of that is $40,000. Now that's an annual basis. So $40,000. That 40,000 is called the overage. They are over. So let's pull out our handy dandy calculator and go, hey Siri, what's 40,000 divided by 12? It's $3,333 a month with some change. So in this example, because we're doing it by the month, this tenant's monthly rent would be the 1,000 base plus the overage, which is then made converted into a monthly basis. So this tenant would pay this amount of money per month and is comprised of the base and the percentage. Okay, that is a percentage lease. Sometimes you hear it called a participation because the more the uh, tenant does or the better the tenant does the better the landlord does now i will give you a hint on a test trick and i've told you there are many tricks on this exam the test really isn't that hard so they kind of got to make it tricky to make sure you understand and that trick is going to come right here I have seen leases that say a base or a percent. Make sure you read the question carefully and understand, is this lease rate a base plus a percentage? The other option is, is it a base or a percentage? And typically, the key that should trigger you in your head when you see it is it will say something like a base or a percentage, whichever is the higher. So I'm going to make an example up where you could say, well, the base is $2,400 a month, but you go through the math and you see that the percentage, uh, the percentage might be 2,510 a month after you do the sales, whatever number, and we're not gonna just assume these are the two. So in this particular example, this is the monthly rent, 2,510, because it said, or a percentage. If we had one that said, and a percentage, now in that example, the answer would be 4,910 because it's both of them. So watch for the trick. And like I said, the way that you can usually spot the trick is you see in the question, it's gonna say a base or whichever is the higher of the two, that should be the key that you go, hey, that looks funny. Oh, I better look back and realize it said or. That is a base or a percentage. And that is what they call a percentage lease deal. And it's used a lot in retail where there's fluctuating. I've seen it a lot in uh, restaurants as well.